Good evening. Uh, thank you for hanging out with us. If you just tuned in, we're a little bit late, but we have a diligent sound crew and outside of church that didn't mind a phone call. So thank you, everybody, who makes this possible tonight. You know, glad you glad you are tuned in. And uh, we'll see what the Lord has to say and do this evening. And um, all we can expect is good things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, your diligence with us, Lord. And thank you for the diligence that you have put into your people that sometimes when obstacles come in our way, we don't give up. We just keep going, Lord. And um, we thank you for that. So we just ask and invite you into everything this evening, every thought, word, Lord. Clear our minds, our spirits of whatever may have been before, Lord, because this is the now, your time with us and our time with you. Let nothing hinder it. Let nothing try to come in and make it do anything else except what we need it to be and want it to be, which is praise and worship and honor to who you are, Lord. And we ask in your precious name, Lord, amen. Amen. Um, we're all sitting here tonight, for the most part, with sight. Amen. We are here with breath in our bodies, some a little bit more labored than others, but amen, we're here, right? We're doing what we do. Thank you, Roger. We have taste. We just had some incredibly delicious tuna casserole that Sandy made, amen, and those sweet Hawaiian rolls. Sometimes are these things that we like take for granted, right? Breath and, and hearing and sight and taste. And how about movement? We wake up and we can move. And we, there are those brothers and sisters who, for whatever reason, don't have taste or they don't have movement. But God in that has enhanced something else in their lives to make up for the things that we think they might not have. You ever notice that? Someone might not be able to see well, but they can hear incredibly. They might not be able to see, but they can touch things and just know what it is just by the touch of their hands. So whatever we think we might have or not have, God has supplied everything that we need as the person that we are. Amen? You got that? Everything that we need, he has supplied to us for the person that we are. Amen? So sometimes, though, we need a reminder like tonight. Tonight's going to be kind of a reminder because the world is in turmoil. And all these things that are out there, we don't know where to quite, even believers sometimes, where should we put our trust? What's going to happen over here? You know, what is this all about? And we lose track sometimes of who's still in charge. Amen? So whatever we give to God, right, whatever we give to God, if it's up for our speech, if it's our praise, or if it's an offering, whatever we give to God, he has given to us first. <laughs> Amen? Whatever I can return to God, God has already given to me or us first. If it's the praise of our mouth, it's that we can talk. If it's the lifting of our hands, if it's a tithe, if it's being able to help somebody fix a fence, whatever that is, whatever he's given us as abilities, right? Whatever we give back to him, whatever, think about it, whatever it is, he's given to us first. Pretty cool. Amen? <laughs> to go back to school, right? To work and retire. All the things that in between, the same. For all of the things that the ladies are doing in the soundboard, all the things that the sound people do, whatever, sing, play, preach, read, what work with the children, that's all stuff that God has given to us and put in us first. Think of something we're giving back or we can do that he didn't give us. Try. <laughs> Amen. Think about it. Whatever we give back to God, God has given to us first. So we're going to look at some things tonight. 
just the, for me, this is what where God has put me for the past few weeks. Turn to Psalm 24 and verse 1. 24 and verse 1. This is just kind of, if anything, this is a reminder, like we just said. This, the, these are reminders. Just a quick reminder. You can even name that if you want it to be. Could call it who are you or just a quick reminder. Amen. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's. And the earth here is the orb. Third rock from the sun. There was nothing else on it. It's his. Right? The earth is the Lord's. We have people today and leaders today, they think the earth is theirs. They're dropping bombs and trying to dissect it and break it into little kingdoms and systems and all these things. They're foolish people. It has always been since creation and will always be until the end. And it's a new heaven and a new earth, the Lord's. Doesn't matter how much they rant and rave and pretend, the earth is the Lord's. Reminder. Remember, as we go through, reminder. The earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. Everything in it is the Lord's. Every created atom, every created piece of coal, every rock, every grain of sand, whatever it is, it all is the Lord's. It's not a king. It's not a sheik. It's not a president. It's not a senator. It's none of theirs. It's all whose? The Lord's. And sometimes we have to be, we start wondering what's going on, right? The fullness, the abundance, the abundance of what's on this earth is in place because God put it there. The oil in the ground, natural gas in the ground, gold in the ground, silver, what is ever there, the abundance of it is God's. We have people killing each other in all these different countries for all these minerals and all of these things because they think it's what? Theirs. It's God's. And he's going to make that known to a lot of people very soon. Amen? The world, now what's the difference between the earth and the world? The earth is the created orb that he created. Okay? The world, okay, the world is that which is inhabited and fertile. That which is producing and that which is inhabited. The earth is the orb. The world is that which is inhabited and filled with his creation. Okay? And all who dwell in them. We have leaders, dictators, all kind of people who are dividing, trying to conquer, like I said, we have people in prisons that sh shouldn't be there. We have all kinds of things happening in the world because certain people think they can lord it over other people. Nobody, what we need is people who understand and can remember that all we are are created beings. God is, in, does that mean we have no leaders? No. But a leader does what? What's a leader supposed to do? Lead. A leader is supposed to lead, not dictate. Right? A leader isn't a dictator. A leader will listen. A leader will come alongside. Right? What was the difference between Abraham Lincoln and just Abraham Lincoln and who we have for president now? Right? We had a leader, and now we have what? Someone who's not leading, but just trying to what? Take the things that they think are right and do what? Push them through. If you don't like it, if you try to speak out, we'll imprison you. We will throw you off whatever these platforms are. You'll lose your job because why? 
you cannot you cannot have an opinion that differs from the people who think they are really in charge. Is it getting worse? Yes. Yes. Will it get better? Maybe. And if it does get better, it's only going to get worse again and worse until Christ comes. Amen? That doesn't mean you don't think about who you vote. None of those things. All I'm saying is we, as believers, have to keep in mind who God is. The earth <coughs> is his, the fullness thereof, and the world is his, and the people thereof. Okay? Keep that in mind when we start to, to fret a little bit. We're going to look at we're going to look at three psalms right now real quick, okay? Just to kind of reinforce what we're talking about. Go to Psalm 96, verses 4 and 5. 96, verses 4 and 5. I don't know about you guys, but I need reminders a lot. 96, verses 4 through 6. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Amen? He is to be feared above all small g gods. We have a lot of people, a lot of situations, a lot of governments thinking they are gods. In their own minds, they think they're gods. But they're not. How many gods are there? True gods. One. Verse 5. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. There's no second place. There's not, you don't get a second place trophy here. It's God and nothing else. There is no second place. To, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. It doesn't matter how large your country is or how much money or how many tanks you have. It's meaningless. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. What's an idol? Something that man has made to worship, other than understanding who the true and living God is and worshiping him alone. We're going to look at Psalm, and this is why God has the right to say that. Psalm 115 Psalm 115. This is why God says all little I idols are just that. 100, Psalm 115, verses 3 through 8. Now, it says, but our God is in heaven. Not our gods, not our idols. Our God is in heaven. And he does whatever he pleases. He raises up nations, and he lays them low. If he wants it to rain, it will rain. If he does it not want it to rain, it will not rain. Amen? He does what he pleases. Not what we please, but what he pleases. These are, remember, these are reminders, <laughs> just in case. Okay? Now look, he does what he pleases. Verse 4, their idols, here we are again, are silver and gold. What is the world worshiping today? What does the world always worship? I don't care if it's Nebuchadnezzar. I don't care if it's the Egyptians, the Assyrians, anybody. What do they worship? Power. What would bring power back then? Silver and gold. Silver, like we said, when Solomon was king, he was getting 25 tons of gold a year. Did Solomon last? No. Their idols are gold and silver and the works of men's hands. Notice how many times we're talking what we hear about men. Okay. Verse 5. These are the idols. They have mouths, but they can't speak. You can carve an idol, but go to idol, an idol for hope. Go speak to an idol and look for wisdom. Right? You're never going to get it because they cannot speak. Verse, at the end of verse 5, eyes, they have eyes, but they don't see. Take a look at the leaders that we have today. 
They have eyes, but do they see? No. They can't see what's happening right in front of their faces. And the problem with most of the leaders we have today is that they can speak. No, it's that they can speak. If the God, just like in fact, with the prophet, when the, the husband of Elizabeth, who was going to have John the Baptist, and said it can't happen, it won't happen, the angel said, I'm going to put your tongue and cleave it to the roof of your mouth, and you're not going to speak again until I tell you. And guess what? It was like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, until it was time to speak. Can you imagine if that happened to all the people running the country? They'd wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They couldn't say anything. The world would be a much better place. <laughs> Verse 6. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, and they can't smell. They can't hear. Listen, the people who are saying, enough is enough. What are you doing to our children? What are you doing to the unborn? What are you doing to the people on this planet? What are you doing? You pretend that they don't sit back in their ivory towers and not hear the ramifications that are coming back from the people? They have to. Hear. But what is it? They don't hear. They pretend they don't hear. Verse 7, they have hands, but they do not handle. Feet, they have, but they do not walk. They have all the parts that they need to do good. Hands that create things that would help people. Feet that would go actually see what's going on and be and see what the needs are but they don't. Are these leaders, that do they want to go to the border? No. Do they actually want to go to where that train derails? Do they want to go to where they need to go and be the hands and the feet, like Christ said, to the people who are hurting? No. They go, well, we'll get there. You know who's at those places first? Franklin Graham and the ministries that want to go there and help the people who are in need. They bring the hands and they bring the feet into the situations that need them. Not the idols, not the little I idols. Verse 8. And those who make them, the idol makers, the ones that want to carve into other, so is everyone who trusts in them. They, they are worthless. They can do no good. They cannot bring any relief into someone's life. The ones who worship it and carve them are just like them. Useless. Useless. That's why we go to the one true and living God. No idols. And if I have them in my life or someone has, has them in their life, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter if it's drugs, it doesn't matter if it's alcohol, all of them lists of things that we worship, that we've been worshiping for years instead of the true living God. Let tonight be the night where you get rid of those idols. Myself, I've got idols that are still hanging around in my life, and everybody that's listening has them. Let go of the idols and let the one true and living God come in and do the work that he wants to do. And that's for me, and it might be for somebody else. Amen. Now we're going to go, we're going to look at two verses in Psalm 8. We're going to look at verse 3 and verse 4 in Psalm 8. It kind of goes back to the who are you and, and sometimes who do, who do we think we are instead of looking at ourselves in the eyes of how Christ would look at us. It's not how I view me or how we view each other. It's, it's wondering and prayfully hoping that God sees us the way it, we need to be seen. Psalm 8, Psalm 8, verse 3. And part of what this is is about bringing things back to perspective, okay? Because for me, and I... Sometimes I, anybody lose perspective, we start 
you know, we kind of, perspective is a, is, a, is a what? Sometimes you get out on the margins and a perspective is what? Bringing things back to the center, right? Okay? Like pastor would say, like when you're, you have a, a schoolyard, the kids are playing. If there's no fence, they all huddle together and they won't play. But if you put a fence, they feel safe. And they'll just run all over the place up to where the fence is because they know they're safe. That's how God is. Come back to that, that parameter that he wants for our lives. We think parameters are kind of, what's that word? They close in on us. They become, I don't need a parameter. Yes, I do. Yes, we all do. We can play better in the safety of where God has kept us. Right? He'll let, he'll let me go way out wherever I want to go. And when I'm out there, guess what? I'm on my own. But when he brings us back to the confines of, of who Christ is and who he wants to be in our life, guess what? Life gets a whole lot safer. So that's what we're looking at here, okay? These two verses are kind of like just the reason for them is to keep us in where we're supposed to be. He says, when I consider, right? It's consider means to, to put in mind, to think about, put perspective to, okay? When I consider the heavens, remember a couple of months and months ago, we did a study and we went outside, the moon was full. We walked out there. And we walked out, we just kind of just walked out. And one person finally looked up and went, look at the moon. Look how full that, look at how beautiful that is, right? So when I consider that, guess what that does to me in my perspective? It brings us back in place, okay? When I consider the heavens, the works of your fingers, why would he say the works of your fingers? We look out there and we see you know, the Hubble telescopes and all these scientists are going, wow, this thing is like expanding and there's things with it's like, wow, and it's like their minds are blown. They get it back, oh, we didn't know that. Look at this happening. So this is great. And, think. and God says, the creation that we see are the works of my fingers. We have to understand the relevance of how great he is to the relevancy of how small we are. See, we think somehow we did some creating. Humans do a lot of, you know, a lot of destruction, and they, cre they create some things. But what are they trying to do right now? They're doing their best to blow the whole world up. They're, they're ruining nations. They're taking things that should be absolutely pristine and beautiful and just bombing them, doing whatever. God says that everything you see was the work of a finger. That's why we have to get to what we're getting to here. The moon, the stars, which you ordained, which means he put in place. They were his idea. There was nothing happening. They were his thought. I want the moon here. I want the sun there. I want the oceans here. I want that galaxy there. He ordained them all. Not some of them. All of them. Right? I was talking to somebody, I forget who it was, and they were talking about the world. They said, it, oh, I think it was Sandy and I about Romans. When people, when Paul said that creation and consciousness tell us that there has to be something greater than us, it has to be a God. And I said, well, what do you talk to people? When they... If the ocean comes in and the tide comes in, why does it stop? Why doesn't it just keep going? Because if you're reading the book of Job, it says when God finally tells Job, you want to question me? Now stand up. I'm going to question you. Stand up there like a man. He goes, you tell me who told the waves of the sea this far and no further. God did. You think the waters just said, okay, it's time to stop? They stopped because God said, this is your stopping point. Or else it is. Amen. The moon and the stars which you have ordained. 
Look at verse 4. What is man, what is man that you are mindful of him? What's the point of that? What is man? When you think about all these things that he did, what are we that we even cross God's mind? If the works of everything seen and unseen, galaxies that they don't even know exist, are the works of his finger, then who are we that you even think about us? Why are you mindful of Chuck or me or Jeff, any of us, if that is that and this is this? Puts it a little, <laughs> takes the perspective and goes, yeah, I think that's pretty hot something until when God says, wait a minute. David said, what are we that you even think about us? But we know, even from Scripture, that what? He had a son that from before there was a foundation of the earth, before it was even created, that son was going to have to come and die for us. He was the lamb slain before there was a foundation of any earth. Amen. That's how much we meant to him. And the per that's the perspective. How much of that am I going to understand that I had nothing to do with? You know, I sit in here breathing, we have nothing to do with that? <laughs> Think about it. We're sitting here hearing, what do, I, what do we have to do with that? We can see. We can smell. We can talk. Guess what? If he wanted that to end right now, poof, there'd be bodies in here. What he's given us right now is what we give back to him. We are doing what we're doing because of his grace in our lives. And sometimes we start thinking we have something to do about this. Hey, look out. No. When I think of the earth, the fullness thereof, and the world and the peoples thereof. That brings us back to an understanding that he wants us to know who he is and who we really are. Loved, created, and all of those, but he is still what? The creator, and we are still the what? Creation. And the son of man that you should come and visit. You got one thing. You got in the first verse that you should care about us or yeah, care about. And the second part is visit us that you should care for. He doesn't just care about us. He cares for us. It'd be like for God so loved the world. Like when we did this years ago, for God so loved the world that. Right. If he loved the world and didn't know that wasn't there, he'd just be sitting in heaven and we'd still be going, yeah, he loved it. Yeah, he loved it. Without the that, that he sent, that whoever should believe should not perish but have everlasting life. And when we went through John 16, what was the most important one? <laughs> that. And it's the same thing here. That you're mindful of means you care about. And but you did come to visit, which means you care for. Okay? Now, it's interesting. When you talk about the first man, where it says, son of man, right? In verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him? That means in the language, weak, sick, or frail. <laughs> We're thinking of ourselves. Arnold and all the, you know, blah, 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 run through brick walls. That's not what the word, man, when that word man means weak, sick, or frail. That'll put us in our place. In the Hebrew, that's what that word means. Sick and frail. And the second man, where it says, where you are son of man, that means the same thing. Weakness, frailty, earth born of the dirt. We come from the ground. It isn't like 
Both terms mean just that, weaknesses, frailty, and you come out of the dirt. So don't think of yourselves more highly than what you ought, right? Because the more I think about me, or the more we think about others more highly, then we're taking our eyes and everything off of who our sight should be really focused on. Because I'm weak and frail, and I come out of the dirt. And the only thing and reason that happened is because of who he is. Now, once we become weak and, good question. Do we ever become anything but weak and frail? Ongoing, right? But as soon as I start thinking that I'm not weak and frail, right? And that's not, that's not a bad thing. Because what does God want us to stay? Humble. Humble. Any of, I, I have, any of us have a hard time kind of staying humble sometimes? Right? When I understand who I was created by and what I was called in the Hebrew, weak and frail, <laughs> right? And coming from the dirt, it kind of keeps things in perspective. Now, the only thing I can boast on is I boast in the God who I have come to know because of his loving kindness for me. Without him, what are we? We're train wrecks. We are freaking train wreck. There's not a strong thing about me. I mean, I can still work. There's some things I, but the soon, I mean, and if I stop to think about it, that's a fleeting, fleeting thought. I need to get back to the things that he wants me to see. And sometimes I don't know how that works. Sometimes anybody still start thinking, been still in your bare hands? Nah. <laughs> no, we think so. But that's not, he goes, he goes, Dave, you're, you're still pretty weak and frail. You're right, Lord. Yeah. And guess what? Come down to it. Your ancestors that came right out of the dirt. I created you out of the dirt. Because that's what he did. Right? That's what Adam means. From the earth. So, amen. When I consider these things, we're going to, by remembering him, right, they imitated the Lord. We're talking about the, the nation of Israel. OK, by remembering him, because when they when the, when the nation of Israel got in their most trouble, they forgot to do what? Remember him. They started thinking they had something to do with it. They did that for 40 years. Wandering around and all he kept saying, remember me, remember who I am and not who you are. And so after that, he goes. So the nation of Israel, because you have to remember by remembering him, we have to remember that he will never forget us. The more I keep remembering who he is and what he's done, right, easier it's going to be to keep remembering who he is. When I remember his faithfulness in my life, I have to remember where the faithfulness came from. I have no faith without him. I have no faithfulness without understanding what faithfulness is. We have to have something to use as our due north. Who is, the greatest, who is the greatest person that ever walked and lived by faith? Who? Christ. Why? He had to go from heaven to earth and believe that when he died on that cross and they put him in the ground that he was going to be raised from the dead. That's faith. I'm going to go to earth and they're going to spit on me and pluck my beard out, and I'm going to do really nice things, and they're going to nail me to a cross, and I'm going to die. I'm going to give up my life. Nobody takes it. I give it up, and I'm going to be put in the ground. And on the third day, you're going to bring me back to life, Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll go do that. By faith, he was the greatest faith liver walker that will ever live or walk this earth. Why? He had to be our example of those things. He had a, that's Philippians 2. He was the God man. He did no pretense of understanding. 
this is what I am in the flesh, but this is who I am in God, and he never let one get in the way of the other. Why? Because he had a faith in a father that he knew was going to allow him to do these things. He didn't have to pretend to be God, and he didn't have to fear being man. He just had to be what? What he was. And what's the best way for us to stay in tune to our Lord? Just be what he has made us to be. Not forgetting that what am I that you even thought about me? Let alone what am I that you came and died on a cross for me? And if you're, li if you're watching tonight and you don't understand that, it, it's not to be understood, it's to be received. If you have not let Christ be your Lord Savior tonight, just say, Lord Jesus, I don't understand why a God could love me so much, but he did, and he does. And all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, please. I believe you died on the cross. I believe they buried you, and I believe on the third day you rose again. Come into my life and be this God you want to be in my life. He did that. I don't know. Get a hold of us, but please, please. One more thing. One more thing. Turn to Psalm 97.5, and then we'll be done. Psalm 97, verse 5. Hallelujah. You guys there? There at home? Psalm 97, verse 5. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Think about it. When he says the mountains, in the days when they were writing Psalms, when they were writing Scripture, there was nothing greater, nothing stronger, nothing more impeding or impending in their lives than a mountain. When we went to Israel... Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. Do you think by accident? No. No. Nothing. Every time they talk about strength or safety or anything, it was always about a mountain. Look what it says. Verse 5 again. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. How dare we think we have some kind of strength, power, or anything else? Mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. So we get in the picture. We have a whole bunch of people. All around this globe that God created, that when the mountains saw him, when the presence of God came to this earth, his presence, they would melt like wax. And we have people, men and whatever, little demagogues, little bitty I-D-O-L idols, thinking that they They have no power. The only power they have at this second is what God is allowing them to have. And they're not wise enough to know why. Because like the little idols, they have ears, but they can't hear. They have eyes that can't even see what's happening before them. They don't have a mind that's open enough to how small they are to understand how great our God is. And that's the sign of an idol. What I have to do for me is to make sure I don't let that small I-D-O-L grow in me, that I miss the one who, when he comes, the mountains will melt like wax. Amen? Lord, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank that you are who you are. I am what I am. And all those who are listening and are sitting here are who they are.
who we are. Blessed that you are even mindful of us, Lord God. Oh, everything seen and unseen is the work of your fingers, yet you are mindful of us. Not just mindful, you love us. You are faithful to us enough to send your son Jesus for us. Help us next time when it's daylight tomorrow and we look out and we see the mountains over there on the other side of the San Gabriel Valley, Lord. Thank you that when your presence comes, they will melt like wax. Thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you for who we are, Lord. And thank you that you have worked in our lives, Holy Spirit, that we can know the difference. Forgive us, forgive us when we kind of like overstep our bounds, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for guiding us, protecting us, providing for us. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.